So that's 23 congregations that have supported this meeting. About 20 years ago, Brian, I used to drive from Chattanooga to Robert Street and preach every now and then. And I don't know if you would remember that or if you were there, but one thing that really impressed me was that before the worship service, the children would come down front and do Bible drills, and I'll tell you that was the smartest bunch of kids. I think I don't. Do y'all still do those Bible drills? That was wonderful. Maybe y'all to do them again. But it is good to have you here tonight. Now I want to introduce our speaker, and you're going to know him for yourself in a few minutes. Not so much of his personal history, but you'll know him by the things that he says. That's the best way for a preacher to be known, anyway. By the way he preaches. And uh, we're glad to have Michael Shepard with us here from Pensacola, Florida. And uh, as I understand it, Robert, you met him over at Polishing the Pulpit. And that's how this connection got made so that he is here with us at this time. And those of you that have been here before this week will appreciate what I'm about to say. When Michael Shepard stands up to preach, just be patient and give him time. He'll find his place in his Bible somewhere when he begins to, to use the screen. He'll find it in a minute, you know. And, uh, and listen close because he'll be very soft-spoken and you'll want to make sure you catch every word that he says. There's a story told about a fellow named John Taylor who was reading his Bible back in the late 17 and early 1800s. And he said, we're not teaching the plan of salvation right. And so he started teaching people in his little locality they needed to be baptized for the remission of their sins. And when they challenged him on it, he said, look, we've got to abandon all these creeds and go right back to the Bible and be baptized for the remission of sins. Along the way, someone called him a Campbellite. And he didn't know what they were talking about. But later he heard where Alexander Campbell was preaching. And he went to hear Alexander Campbell. And when he got through listening to Alexander Campbell, he said, I don't think I'll have to <coughs> preach again after hearing that man preach because he was so impressed. We got a number of preachers here tonight. Don't get discouraged, okay? We're going to hear Michael Shepard <laughs> preach tonight, but we'll just keep doing our best and we'll let him be Michael Shepard. And Michael, I want to turn this part of our worship service over to you because while we love Michael, we are here to worship and honor God. We've been led in prayer, we've been led in song, and now we're going to be led in the study of God's word in honor of our Heavenly Father. And Michael will do that as he brings us this lesson. Brother Bill suggested I should start in the book of Exodus, and that's where we'll start tonight. The book of Exodus has 40 scintillating chapters. In the first two chapters, we see the introduction of the book. In chapter 3, Moses is commissioned to go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. In Exodus 5 and verse 2, Pharaoh says, Who is this God? I am an Egyptian king that I should obey his voice. In Exodus 7 through 11, God sent these ten plagues down on the children of Israel and uh, convinced them uh, to let God's people go. Now, I'm going to get to my lesson tonight, my sermon. But since Brother Bill mentioned that, then I'm going to have to add at least 45 minutes on to what I had originally <laughs> said. So if you like the sermon, give him credit for it. If you got any problems, take it out on him. <laughs> so we see what's going on. We find the children of Israel in Egyptian bondage. Now, when the children of Israel leave Egyptian bondage, you'll find record or authentication of that in Exodus 13 through 18. They're on their way to that promised land, to Canaan's land. Now, this is a two-month journey from Exodus 13 through Exodus 18. It takes them two months to get to, to Mount Sinai. Now, when we get to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, 
all of the book of Leviticus and the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers. There's some very interesting things happen when they get to Sinai because they spent one solid year at Mount Sinai. It was at the foot of Mount Sinai where they organized the number of the children of Israel. It was at the foot of Mount Sinai, you remember where they made the golden calf. It was at the foot of Mount Sinai where they made the tabernacle. And it was on this occasion that God called Moses up on Mount Sinai and he gave man the first written law that man ever had. Now you remember in Hebrews 1 and verse 1, God who has sundry times and then divers man of spake in time past. God spoke in various ways. During this particular time, didn't have no written word. For the first 1,500 years, man was without written word. But now, when they get to Sinai, God called Moses up on Mount Sinai and gave man the first written law that man ever had. You'll find that law in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. I'm the Lord your God that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee in the grave an image of bow down before him, nor worship them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. Now we find that law not given to the Hamites, nor was it given to the Japhethites. It was given to the Shemite people of the world. It was given to a certain people for a certain purpose for a certain period of time. And so we see that law given now. God's people got to worship them. Also, there were some other things that happened. It was at the foot of Mount Sinai, on Mount Sinai, when God called Moses up. He gave them the sacrificial feast. You'll find that in Leviticus 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7. He also gave them uh, the priesthood. You got to worship God. Gave them the sacrificial priest as well in Exodus 28. And told them what kind of clothes to put on in Exodus 29. And gave them worship in Exodus 30. So we see now the children of Israel is at the foot of Mount Sinai or at Sinai for one solid year. That's Exodus 19, that's all of the book of Leviticus, and that's the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers. That's one solid year at Sinai. Now, you remember, those 12 spies had to go and spy out the land. And of course, 10 came back with a negative report. Two came back with a positive report. That positive report, people wanted to kill Joshua, wanted to kill Caleb, wanted to kill Moses. We oftentimes tag this period as the period of unbelief. That's Exodus 12, 13, 14. Those Exodus 11, 12, 13, and 14. That's the period of unbelief. And as a result of that negative report, God says, since it took you 40 days to spy the land, for your punishment from coming back with that negative report, I'm going to give you one year for every day to think about that. It took you 40 days to go out there and spy the land. You come back with that negative report, I'm giving you 40 years to think about it. And as a result, in Exodus, in, in Numbers 15, all the way to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we see God's people 40 years meandering in the wilderness. In Numbers chapter 1, verses 45 to 47, that was 603,550 left Egyptian bondage. All that was 20 years old and over that was ready to go to war except the tribe of Levi, 603,550 people. Now out of that number, 603,548, guess what? They died out there in the wilderness. 
out of that number that left Egyptian bondage. Numbers chapter 1, verses 45 to 47. 603,550 folk left there. According to Numbers 1, how many crossed over into Canaan's land? What happened to the 603,548? They died out there in the wilderness in a span of 40 years. Why? Because of their stubbornness, because of their stiff neck, because of their hard headedness, and because of their hard heart. Let me break that down for you. That's over 15,000 funerals per year. Let me break that down for you. That's over 41 deaths per day. That can change people. 41 deaths a day? That can change people? Because people are so stubborn, they want to have their own way, they don't want to do it God's way. And as a, result, as a result, God says, I'll let you die there in the wilderness. Now, I make that observation for this point. When they, or when we get the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy consists of a time of two months. The first 30 days, Moses is preparing. Because you know what the book of Deuteronomy, the, the word Deuteronomy just simply means second law. It's a repeating of the laws that was given to the book in the book of Exodus that was given to that first generation. Now there's a generation that was born in the wilderness. And Moses take the first 30 days, the book of Deuteronomy, to prepare these people to go over into the land of Canaan don't make the same mistakes that your fathers did. Don't make the same mistakes. The first 30 days, God has promised you heaven. But the wilderness was a training ground for you. You remember in Deuteronomy 8? I gave you clothes that didn't wax old. Gave you shoes that didn't wear out. 40 days walking in and your feet didn't even swell. 40 days walking in the same pair of shoes and you think Nike got something going on? You think Steph Curry and Al Jordan got something going on? I would love to have a pair of them. <laughs> the same clothes and they didn't get old. And you know how our wives and our daughters don't want to say, wear the same thing twice? <laughs> Amen. But here, God is showing these people his providential care, his omnibenevolence. And God is saying, the wilderness is a training ground. And I sent you out there, Deuteronomy, to do what? To test you. Test you what? To see how you're going to act in the wilderness. Because if you act right in the wilderness, when you get over in the Canaan's land, you'll act right over there. And if you're cut up in the wilderness, I'll let you die out there in the wilderness before I let you come over there and tear Canaan's land up. I'm telling you for us as members of the church, the church is a training ground, neighbor. Oh, yes, it is. Because if we can't act right down here, heaven is not going to be an arena for us to get up and say, brothers and sisters, I've sinned. I repent of my sin. You know, that's a memorialized statement in most churches of Christ now. I repent of my sin. I ask the church to pray for me that I might grow stronger. The church is a training ground, just like the wilderness was a training ground. Because if you act right in the wilderness, when you go over in the Canaan's land, you'll act right over there. If we act right in the church, neighbor, when we get to heaven, we'll act right up there. And so as a result, 600, 3,548 died out there in the wilderness. I wonder how many of us believe that. I wonder how many of us believe the Bible. 
only two crossed over. That was Joshua and Caleb. Now, I want you to look real quickly at the 12th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, here God sets out parameters. God set some parameters out. God says, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, when you cross over in the Jordan, verses 4 and 5, God says, I'm going to give you a place to put my name there. Verses 11 through 13, whatever that place, wherever that place is, that's where you need to offer your worship. Jeremiah 32, 39, God says, I've given them one heart and one way. God only had one way in that Old Testament neighbor. God says, when you go across there, I'm going to name the place for you to put my name there. That's what God says. God says in Deuteronomy 7, now, don't give your sons nor your daughters to the heathens in marriage. Because if you do, they're going to turn your heart against me and my anger is going to be kindled against you. Don't even give your children to the fire. That's what God says. God says in Deuteronomy 7, when you cross over, you're going to incur seven ikes there. Hittites, Hivites, Gergesites, Perizzites, Amorites, Canaanites. They're going to be mightier than you. I want them destroyed. God says, I want you to tear down their groves. God says, I want you to tear and destroy their names. That's what God says. And God says, I'm going to choose a place to put my name there. And that's where you're going to worship. Holy, wait a minute. Now, if God is going to choose the place, then nobody else can choose it. Now, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, listen to me carefully. When those children of Israel came across that Jordan River, God was not standing on the other side of that river. Come on over here. And you're going to see all kinds of places where the heathens are worshiping their gods. And you can just go to the place of your choice. Any place will do. When you go across that Jordan River, there's going to be all kinds of places where the heathens are going to be worshiping their god. And one place is just as good as another. We hear that kind of ignorance today. One place is as good as another. As long as a place is a place is a place is a place. Choose the place of your choice. But that's not what Deuteronomy says. Deuteronomy says, God says, I'm going to choose the place. And if God is going to choose the place, nobody else can choose it, friend. God only had one worship place. That's all he had. And you know the place that God chose. Neighbor, God chose Jerusalem. That's the place he chose. No other place. Second Chronicles 33 verses 3 through 7. God chose Jerusalem. That's what he chose. And if God chose Jerusalem, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, in regardless to all of those high places, you see, high places was where the heathens worship their idol gods. High places was. God says in Deuteronomy 7, I want those places destroyed. That's what God says. I want those places destroyed. And God says, I'm going to choose the place to put my name there. And there, in verses 11 through 13, that's where you're going to bring all of your offerings to me and worship me. So Jerusalem was the place. Now I want to show you something before I leave the book of Deuteronomy. In, verse, in chapter 7, God says, I want those places destroyed. Let me show you exactly what happens when people are disobedient to God's word. Because today, and you may be thinking, the more worship places we have, the better off we are. 
Let me tell you something tonight, friend. The more worship places we have, the worst off we are. He better mark it down. Denominationalism destroys and tear up homes. Denominationalism causes us to have a corrupt government. That's what denominationalism does. We better get back and start studying it. I'll be there in just a moment in 1 Samuel. That's what denominationalism does, friend. Division has always been against God's plan. God says when you come across that river, you're going to see all kinds of denominational places. You're going to see people worshiping their gods all kinds of ways. I want those places destroyed. And I'm going to choose the plays. Look what happens. You got a wife worshiping over there in that denominational church. Husband back over there in that church. Children over there in that church. Grandparents over there in that church. All it does is divide. It's so destructive. That has never been God's plan. God said, I've given them one heart in one way. I don't have to go to the New Testament to prove that. I know God only has one worship place a day, neighbor, and that's the Church of Christ. And I'm not ashamed to say it. He only has one worship place. He doesn't have a thousand or ten thousand. That never been God's plan. And that's exactly why denominationalism is growing like it's growing. Because we in the church, we act like we are ashamed. We're well, going to be ashamed not to preach it. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. This is what's going to save the souls of men. Denominationalism is sin. Jesus Christ in his great prayer, what did he pray for? Neither pray out for these alone, but for them also who shall believe on me through that word. That is the apostles' word. That there also might be 1,000. There also might be one. Thou art in me and I in thee, that there also may be one in us, that the world might believe that God has sent me. John 17, 20 to 22. In the first five verses, Jesus Christ prayed for himself. Verses 6 through 19, he prayed for the apostles. And then he said, neither pray I for these alone. Who had you been praying for, Jesus? Pray for himself. Pray for his apostles. Now he is praying for those who shall believe on me through their word. That they all might be one. God only had one way in the Old Testament. That's all he had. Isn't it ironic that he shut down that way of worship and that patriarchal dispensation before he brought that, mo mo uh, that mosaic worship in? Isn't it strange that he shut down that mosaic dispensation and that way of worship before he brought New Testament worship in? Oh, yes, friend. Up under that first dispensation, it was an altar system. Every father erected an altar, carried out his obedience unto God. Up under that second dispensation, they started off in the tabernacle, then in the temple, then in the synagogue. Up under this third dispensation, it is where every man worships, not geographically. Don't have to go to Jerusalem, but you got to worship God according to the divine New Testament teaching. Up under that first dispensation, Sunday didn't mean no more of those people than Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. How about in that second dispensation? They remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. How about in this Christian dispensation in which you and I live? We remember the Lord's death every first day of the week. How about in that first dispensation? Every father acted as a priest of his own family. How about in that second dispensation? All of the priests came from the tribe of Levi. How about in this Christian dispensation in which we are living in now? Anybody that obey the gospel of Christ? According to my brother Peter, he says he's a priest. First Peter 2 and verse 5. There were differences, and I can go on and on and on and on and on to show you the differences between all three dispensations. God had to close one down before he started the other one because he is not going to allow but one worship at one time, neighbor. That's all. There's not going to be a group of people over there worshiping God, all those things, mechanical music, uh, the Women leadership, woman preachers, and all that kind of choirs and solos. And then you got another group over there worshiping God some other kind of way. 
And then another group and another group and another. God only has one worship neighbor. Just like he only has one doctrine. Just like he only has one church. And I'm just arguing it tonight from the New Testament. May argue it tonight from tomorrow. From the Old Testament tomorrow. But just from the, from, the old, from the New Testament tomorrow, the Old Testament tonight. But I'm showing you just from the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 12, God says he wants those places destroyed. Because when those places are not destroyed, then people are going to meander in those places. Let me show you what I'm talking about when people disobey God. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 12. Let's do some reading here. In 2 Kings chapter 12, it is just that important. Let's study the Bible tonight just to do a little reading for you. Let me show you what happens. Now, you remember what God says in Deuteronomy 12. We all agree with that. Is that right? Amen. We all agree with that. God says when you come across that river, you're going to see all kind of denominational buildings over there. You can't worship me like that. That's what God says in Deuteronomy 12 when he is giving the law to the children of Israel before they cross that Jordan River. And Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, God said, Ye shall not add to the word of the Lord as I have commanded you, neither shall you diminish out from it, but that you should keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I have commanded you. When God gave Moses that law up on Mount Sinai, you can't add to it and you can't take away from it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. And God says, I want those places destroyed. And notice what happens when those places are not destroyed. Notice 2 Kings chapter 12. Look what happens here. In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash began to reign, and 40 years reigned he in Jerusalem. Let me just stop right there. You should stay right there. Once, let me get you to where that ge where geographically in the time limit there. Once those children of Israel, because when we get the book of Deuteronomy, the first 30 days, Moses is indoctrinating those people who was born in the wilderness. The last 30 days, Moses died and they mourn his death for 30 days. Now, he commissions Joshua to take the children over in the Canaan's land. You do remember that, don't you? Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Noah, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto a land which I do, uh, unto a land which I do give to them, even unto the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of their foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall I divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and commanded the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this land to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it, and to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh spake, Joshua saying, Remember the words which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little one, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren arm and help them, all the mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord hath given your brethren rest as he hath given you. And they also that possess the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side, Jordan, toward the sun rising. 
And the answer Joshua saying, all that that commanded us, we would do. And whatsoever that sent us, we would go. According as we hearken unto Moses and all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that thus rebel against thy commandments and will not hearken unto thy words and all that I commanded them, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage, Joshua chapter 1. We find that commission right there in the first chapter of the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua has 24 chapters. I'm trying to get you where I got to read here. Joshua has 24 chapters in it. The first 12 chapters, they go over Jordan. And that land is going to be divided. The last 12 chapters of the book of the, you got Joshua, 24 chapters. Canaan conquered, go over and conquer the land. Then Canaan divided. That's the book of Joshua. Now you come to the book of Judges. Now Joshua, he gave 70 years of unblemished, you can't find a blemish on that man's record. This was when Israel was at their most faithfulness. Not under Moses' neighbor. Remember 603,548 died because of their unfaithfulness. They were faithful under Joshua. And not only after Joshua died, even the elders remained faithful, even after Joshua died. Now, after Joshua, what you're going to have after that 70 years, now you come to a period of 350 to 400 years that we call the period of the judges, not the book of judges, the period of the judges. That consists of all of the book of Judges, all of the book of Ruth, and the first 10 chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. That is the period of the Judges. Now, the book of Judges, here where God's people start back their rebellion again. You have four main words, sin, oppression, repentance, and deliverance. In the book of Judges, you got this 350 to 400 year period. That's all of the book of Judges, all of the book of Ruth, and the first 10 chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. That's the period of the Judges. God raised up 15 judges to go out there and get his people. Othniel, Ehud, Shem, God, Deborah, Barak, Gideon, Abimelech, Tol, Jeb, Jephthah, Isban, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, and the last judge was Samuel. And he goes out there and get his people. But those people are so hard-headed and hard-hearted. And Judges 2, verses 11 through 14, you know what you'll read about those people? There is another generation that rose up that knew not God. And in verse 19, you know what the God said about those people? They cease not from their wrongdoings, nor the stubbornness, of their wicked ways. And this is what you got. That period of ungodliness. And now. After that period. What you'll come to. Is the period. Of the United Kingdom. Where the nation of Israel. Were united. On the three kings for 120 years. And those three kings saw David and Solomon. I'm just about there. Second, second kings. Saw David and Solomon. All of them respectfully 40 years. Now, at the death of Solomon, before when Saul, give us a king. We want to be like the nations about us. And you know what happens? God says, because Samuel becomes somewhat discouraged, and I become discouraged when I said that section of scripture. Here these people says, give us a king. Give us a president. Give us a senate. Give us house of representatives. Give us a governor. Was not God their king? 1 Samuel 12 verses 12 through 15. Was not God their God? Why would you want a king? And you got God. And Samuel thought they was going to get rebellion against him. And God had to tell him, you preach to those people. What's going to happen to them? They are going against me. You preach to them. In 1 Samuel 8, you want a king? You want government? 
I'll give you a government. I'll give you a king. But this is what the king is going to do to you. It's no less than seven times in 1 Samuel 8, you know what you'll read. He's going to take and take and take and take and take and take. And I want to tell you something, neighbor. We see our government right there if you know your book. If you know your book. Now, if you can't see it, let me break it down for you a little bit. Samuel says, speaking in half of God, the way we see government have left God. And I want to tell you something. No government can replace nothing that God says, neighbor. No government. God is still God. It makes no difference because people disrespect him. God is still God. And no government cannot overturn not one single passage in this book. Not one. God is still God. And as a result, you know what happens? Take, 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 take. That's the first sign you know that government has left God. You know how I know? Because taxes, taxes. And you know the next thing? Because when people don't want to do it God's way, when people get themselves into a jam, the first thing they're going to do is appeal to government. That's the first thing they're going to do is appeal to government. And as a result, this is what you're going to have. You're going to have all of these subsidized programs. Taxes is going to go up. Nobody is suffering today but that hard working, honest taxpayer. Subsidized housing. Now, don't get me wrong. God has already told us how to, how, how to exercise benevolence. That's not my argument. But we have turned people out into nothing but hustlers today. Nothing but hustlers. Oh, I know you're quiet. You might want, want me to move on. But now, if you start twitching on those seats, I'll stay right here for another hour. <laughs> this is exactly what's happening. High taxes, subsidized housing. You know why? Because people don't want to do it God's way. People want to go out there and have all of those children without being married and then want to appeal to government to take care of those children. And as a result, taxes are going up. The next thing in the 60s, Food stamp program. Let me tell you something, friend. That's one thing I never worry about is food. What on earth do we need a food stamp program for? It's beyond me. All of these rats and roaches and snakes and possums and stuff running around here. What we need with a food stamp program? It's beyond me. And I'm the one that's feeding folk. I can't hardly feed my own folk, my own family. I can't hardly pay my own mortgage. And that's exactly what 1 Samuel 8 is talking about, neighbor. Because what the government is doing is taking from that hardworking man, trying to take care of his own family, to take care of somebody else's family. And you're going to sit there and tell me that stuff is right? That's wrong, neighbor. That's wrong. And as a result, now we got what? Almost a $20 trillion debt. Because of that foolishness. You want government. You want a president. I'll give you one. But this is what he's going to do to you. That's a very difficult section of scripture for me to teach. Because I know what it's talking about, neighbor. And I see what's going on today. That's not God's plan. And as a result, you know what God says in Hosea 13, 11, and 12, I gave him a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. 
That was not God's plan. But if you want a king, you want a president, I'll give you one. Now, the nation of Israel were united for 120 years under three kings. Those three kings were Saul, David, and Solomon. All of them served respectfully 40 years. Now, at the death of Solomon, Rehoboam, his son, ascended to the throne. At the very outset of Rehoboam's reign, God divided the nations as an act of judgment because of the nation's idolatry. Sending ten tribes to the north constituted the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, capital of Samaria, two tribes to the south constituted the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, capital to Jerusalem. And so for the next 250 years, what you got? You got two kingdoms existing side by side. The northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Now, in the north, what you're going to have, you're going to have 19 kings in the north. You're going to have uh, <clears throat> Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, Elam, Zimri, Umri, Ahaz, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu, Jehoahaz, Joash, Jeroboam the second, Zechariah, Salom, Menahem, Pekiah, Pekah, and the last king of that northern kingdom was King Hoshea. And you know 16 of those kings, you know what you're going to read behind their names. All of them walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel a sin. What was the sin? In 1 Kings 13, when Jeroboam, he changed the object of worship from God Almighty to two golden calves. What else did he do? He changed the place of worship. God said, Jerusalem. He changed the place of you of, of worship from Jerusalem to Dan and Bethel. Now on that, he changed the times of worship. Leviticus 23, 34 forward. From the 15th day of the seventh month to the 15th day of the eighth month. Then he changed the priesthood. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 17. He changed the priesthood of worship for the lowest of the people. God's law said, ye shall not add to the will of the Lord as I have commanded you, neither shall you diminish all from it. That's what God said. Don't add to it, nor take away from it. And so what happens? 274, 274 years and six months of long suffering to God, God got tired of it. So in 722 B.C., guess what? That northern kingdom went into a Syrian captivity wherein their national identity came to a cease. Now, what you'll have 135 year gap there after 722 BC. 135 years later, the Southern Kingdom went into Babylonian captivity for a period of 70 years. Now, what you'll have 300 plus years of long suffering. Now, that's going to bring us because from 2 Kings 17 to 2 Kings 25. Now, I want to look at 2 Kings 12. And let me see what happens. Let's see what happens. Stick up here now and go back to Deuteronomy 12 right quick. Deuteronomy 7 and 12. Stick up here and right there. And let me highlight that for you. Go back to Deuteronomy 12 and Deuteronomy 7. Now, in Deuteronomy 7, here these people is crossing over into Canaan's land. Notice what God says now to him. Deuteronomy 7. Look at verse number 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, he gives you those nations, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them. Utterly destroy them. You see what God says. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shall thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. Notice, for they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now watch it, please. But thus deal ye, ye deal with them, ye shall destroy their altars. Anything else? Break down their images. Anything else? Cut down their groves. Anything else? Burn their graven images with fire. That's what God said do. Now, go to Deuteronomy 12 quickly. Quickly. Deuteronomy 12. 
and Deuteronomy 12, here they crossing over into Jordan. Notice what he says. These are the statutes and the judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon this earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods. High places was where those heathens, those denominational places where they worship their gods. Notice, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree, and ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire, and ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. You know why? Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. You're going to see those people worshiping God all kinds of ways. You can't worship me like that. You can't worship me like that. You ride up and down the highways and byways of any city. You're going to see people claiming to be worshiping God on the first day of the week all kinds of ways. Why are you interested in that? Because you can't worship God like that. You can't worship God like that. Notice something else he says here. But, verse 5, but unto the place singular which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation. And uh, when he named the place, verses 6 through 7, that's where you're going to worship me. When God named the place, notice verse number 11, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose. Neighbor, God is going to choose the place. God is going to choose the place. And God chose Jerusalem. That's what God chose. Notice verse number 13. Please watch this. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not your worship in every place you see. You can't worship God in every place you see. God only has one worship place today, neighbor. Just like he only had one worship place here. He only had one worship place here. Notice verse 14. You can worship me in the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Look at verse 18. Which the Lord your God shall choose. Look at verse 19. Take heed to thyself. You cannot forsake the tribe of Levi. And we see that happen in 1 Kings 12 with Jeroboam. Look at verse 21. If the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Now that's what God says. Now notice what happens when people are disobedient to God. Now turn to 2 Kings 12. 2 Kings 12. Let me show you what happens when people do not do what God says. Now remember, every king in the northern kingdom were wicked kings. Every one of them. They walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. Now, in the south, you got 19 kings plus one usurper. You have Rehoboam, Abiah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Armon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and the last king of that southern kingdom was Zedekiah. He was the one that went back to Babylon and changed, just like Hosea 13, 12 says. I gave him a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. Now, you had seven fairly good kings. Two were sure enough good kings in the southern kingdom. That was Hezekiah and his great-grandson, that 16 king by, by the name of Josiah. Josiah was the last righteous king of that southern kingdom. Now, let's read some now. I just had to explain all that to you so it can make a little, little bit of sense to you. Now, notice in verse number one in uh, chapter 12, 2 Kings 12. Notice what happens here. In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash began to reign. Forty years old reigned he. Forty years reigned he in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because that's the place that God chose. Now notice. And his mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And Joash did that 
which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days wherein Jodai, the priest, instructed him. You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? But let's read just a little bit more. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense in those places. What did God say in Deuteronomy 7? What did God say in Deuteronomy 12? God says, I want those places destroyed. And brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, what does that show me? You got to do everything right the way God said it. You got to do it the way God said it. Oh, I know we living now in the year 2015. I know we in the pep age now. I know we are looking to compromise everything now. I know we somehow know the shame of the church of Christ now. We have to do everything down to the latter neighbor. This man was a pretty good king, but there was one thing he didn't do. He disobeyed Deuteronomy 7. Would you agree with me? He disobeyed Deuteronomy 12. Would you agree with me? God says, I wanted those places destroyed. Let me give you some further evidence. Turn the Bibles. Turn to 2 Kings uh, 14. Turn to 2 Kings 14. Turn to 2 Kings 14. 14th chapter of the book of 2 Kings. Let's see something here. In 2 Kings 14. Notice what happens here in verse number 1. In the second year of Joash, son of, jo jo son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned. Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. He reigned 25 years old. He was 25 years old when he began to reign and reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Why in Jerusalem? Because that's the place that God named. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. Notice. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But watch verse number four. How be it? The high places were not taken away as yet the people still worship in those high places. Did he violate Deuteronomy 7? Did he violate Deuteronomy 12? And as a result of him violating Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 12, those people just kept on going over there to those places. How many people lost their souls? Because these people, that priest, and those kings didn't do what God says do. How many people have lost their souls because of preachers? How many people lost their souls because of elders? It's serious business when we start talking about the word of the Lord. Brother Boyd has delineated it so perfectly. We're not here to entertain nobody. You're not here to worship me. We come here to study the book. And it's serious business. There's no plaything. And as a result, we become so casual when it comes to the word of Almighty God. But we had better be careful with it, neighbor. Let me give you just a little bit more. Turn to 2 Kings 15. I ought to just walk you all the way through here. Turn to 2 Kings 15. Notice something here. In the 27th year of Jer uh, Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. 16 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned two and 50 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? Well, let's just read just a little bit more. Notice verse number four. Say that the high places was not removed and the people sacrificed and burned incense and worshiped God in those denominational buildings. That's a violation of Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 12. Those people constantly just keep going to those places claiming to be worshiping God. And losing their souls. 
Drop down to verse number. Drop down to verse number 32. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? You'll say that's a pretty good king, wouldn't you? Let's read. Let's continue to read. Notice verse number 35. How be yet the high places was not removed. God says remove those places. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors. That's exactly what happens. Notice in the 16th chapter. In the 16th chapter, now we got Ahaz, one of the most wickedest men that ever sit on the throne. And notice what he does in verse 3. He violated Leviticus 18 in verse 21. He even had his children to pass through the fire. Even had them to pass through the fire. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, I can go on and on and on. What's my point? The point is, God says in Deuteronomy 7 and in Deuteronomy 12, when those people come across that Jordan River, you're going to see all kinds of denominational buildings over there. How are you going to determine where to worship God? I'm going to name the place. I'm going to name the place. People have been migrating over 1,400 years to denominational churches today. They are claiming to be worshiping God in places that God never told them. God only have one worship place today. And that's the church of Christ. That's the only place he has. In 2 Chronicles. Now, when you study in the Chronicles, the Chronicles are preparing God's people to go back in the land, Jerusalem. To go back. Deuteronomy is preparing those people to cross over. The Chronicles is preparing them to go back when you study the book of Chronicles. Now, in 2 Chronicles 33, let me just give you this. In 2 Chronicles 33, Notice what happens here. We will see vividly in verses 3 through 7. That God chose Jerusalem. Notice what he says. Here. Manassas was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the God, like unto the abominations of the heathens, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Notice, for he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. Hezekiah tore down the high places. Hezekiah's son came right back and built them back up. Notice, he reared up altars for Balaam, made groves and worship all the hosts of heaven. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereas the Lord has said, in Jerusalem, that's where I'm going to put my name forever. He calls his children, he calls his children to pass through the fire. Let me give you just one more. And I want you to be impressed with this man here. Ahaz. Here, you got Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manassas, Ammon, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and the last king is King Zedekiah. Now, notice what happens here. Here, you have Manassas. Yes, Manassas repented, but the last good king of that southern kingdom 
was that boy by the name of Josiah. And we read about him in chapter 34. And we see what he did. Not only, let's just read that. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem for one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. That's exactly what God's law says. For in the eighth year of his reign, now he's 16 years old, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God of David his father. And in the 12th year, when he's 20 years old, look what he did. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places. That's what God said do. He began to do that. And then he purged the groves in verse 3. And called the images and the molten images. In verse number 7. He cut down all of the idols. He did exactly what God told him to do. Exactly what God told him to do. That's exactly what he did. And brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, that's exactly what God commanded them to do. Now, as a result of that, how can we wind it up? We can wind it up this way. God has one worship place, just like he had here. That's all he got. And even though we see all kinds of worship places around here, God still only has one. That's all he has. You remember that was a boy before Hezekiah. You remember what he did. He not only didn't remove the high places, he even closed the doors of the house of the Lord. He even closed the doors. Most certainly did. In chapters 28 and 29. How awful can it be? As a result of that, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, God got a place. Now, in concluding, after this section of scripture, what you're going to have, you're going to have God's people, because of their hard-headedness and hard-heartedness, still go into Babylonian captivity for a period of 70 years. At the end of that 70-year period, because, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he attacked at Jerusalem three times. 606, 597, 586. The last time he attacked at Jerusalem, he flattened the temple. Now, as a result, Cyrus the Persian king opened the floodgates of captivity and allowed those Jews who so desired to return back to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God. Some 50,000 Jews left Babylonian captivity, go back to Jerusalem to do just that. That brings us to the next section of scripture where all your prophets come in. Then you get to the book of Ezra, where you're going to have that first return under Zerubbabel. That will be your first six chapters, your first five chapters of the book of Ezra. When you get to Ezra 6 and 7, that's a 57-year gap right there. That's where the book of Esther comes in. Right there, between Ezra 6 and 7, those 57 years. Now, then you're going to have a second return to restore. You remember Ezra 7 and verse 10, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the Lord, the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. And then uh, that last one is Nehemiah. To rebuild the walls. And when Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah, when he writes the last words, he says, when you open your New Testament, there's going to be somebody coming in the spirit of the prophet of, of Elijah, which is John the Immersa. Now, before you get there, you're going to have 400 years of silence. God was not writing, but he was still working. Now, what happens there? You remember Assyria was once the dead known world power because in 722, he knocked out that northern kingdom. But then somebody took care of the Assyrians. Is that right? That was Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the dead known world power. But then when Medo and Persia merged, 
they took care of Babylon. Oh, yes, they did. And then somebody took care of Medo-Persia. In 332 B.C., a man by the name of Alexander the Great, he conquered the whole world. But after Alexander the Great died, we come now to that period of silence, and that's when another division arose. A four-way split. Syria, Egyptians, Maccabeans, and Romans. And you remember in 167, where uh, uh, the Syrians went into the city of Modin, changed the entire worship, brought in all of that ungodly, idolatrous worship. You remember how the Egyptians and the Syrians was fighting over the geographical land of Jerusalem. Egyptians won, but they kept fighting. Then the Syrians finally won. Then the Maccabean period, then the Romans come on the scene. And from, six, six, from 167 all the way, 67 AD, Romans then known world power. When you open up Matthew chapter 1, Jesus Christ jumps off the page at you. Jumps off the page at you. And when Jesus Christ get into the world, we know who he is. We see his commission implemented in the book of Acts. Now we know what to do to be saved. Because the book of Acts is the implementation of the Lord's great commission. And we see what to do to be saved. We can believe on King Jesus the Christ. We can repent of past sins. We can confess faith in Christ. Then we can be baptized in the King Jesus the Christ. All of that idolatrous worship, all of that stuff was going on. All of them changes with all of them priests and all of them prophets. But I tell you what didn't change. This didn't change. The word of Almighty God. That did not change. And it's not going to change today. Jesus says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, that's one that judges him. There's a whole lot of high places around here, denominational places, claiming to be worshiping God, yet they are so different. Claiming to be various ways of getting to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way. Not one of many ways. I am the truth and I am the light. Don't worship in those places. God has given man only one church to be a member of in this dispensation, and that's the church of Christ. If you are not a member of the church, you can become one unto night. We're going to sing the song of invitation. If I've not preached long enough, I've only touched the hem of the garment. I can take you all the way through the New Testament as well. I most certainly can. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, I did that with the Old Testament because we're so accused of not believing in the Old Testament and, and, and we don't believe in it. I believe every word of it. I just know it's not my faith and practice today. It's not our faith and practice. I don't go back to the Old Testament to find out how to worship God. I don't go back to the Old Testament to find out what to do to be saved. But it is written for our learning. It is written for our example. It is written for our warnings. It's written for our admonition. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6, verse 11, Romans 15, 4. That we do not make the same mistakes hard-headed Israel did. Brother Jim Boyd will be standing down here if you need to respond. Why not? While we sing.